of CSS to control the layout of the web pages. That's a, a very important topic and you should practice it and you should practice doing things different ways uh, from assignment to assignment uh, so that you get experience with a variety of techniques. Are there any questions now at this point as far as that goes? All right. Well, again, in the examples where you have where you are to make two versions of the web page, try to make them as different as possible, including the layout. Um, I think I gave a couple exam, uh, a couple uh, homework assignments like that. And the first one, if you just did colors and fonts, that's okay. But for subsequent ones, I want you to do as much as you can with layout. The topic for this week is, or at least for today, is mobile web development. So we're going to talk about what makes for a good mobile page and, and uh, discuss that for a while. Before I do that, mobile brings in, mo uh, designing for websites is sort of, um, how do I want to say it? it? It's part of a bigger issue, and that bigger issue is making your website work across as ma many platforms as possible. All right, yes. We, we talked about we talked about that, and we will uh, we will talk about that at some point. I think we already talked about having a web server and putting it up there, but yeah, we will um, we'll talk about that in more detail um, at some point in the semester. Um, one of the biggest challenges in developing websites is you don't know what the person on the other end is going to have for your website. In other words, they may be viewing it on a desktop device using Internet Explorer. They may be viewing it using an old version of Internet Explorer. They might be viewing it on a Linux machine. They might be viewing it on a Windows machine, on a Mac machine. And you have no control over what kind of browser they use. Now, in my mind, it, it's a very amateurish thing to do to tell people, well, and, and people don't really do this anymore, but you used to see this back, you know, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, this, this page is best viewed in Internet Explorer, or this page is best viewed in Firefox, or something like that. You don't want to do that. You don't want to restrict people to viewing your site in a particular browser, or tell them that the best experience. You want to make it work across all browsers. <clears throat> Larger organizations have sort of test machines set up, where they may have a variety of different browsers. And it goes beyond, again, each, each browser to different versions of the browser. Remember, <clears throat> the browser is a piece of software that brings your page to life. All right? Your page is just flat text file with tags and content and all that. It's the browser that actually brings it and presents it to the user. And each version of that is a distinct program. It's a distinct piece of software. And it might have issues with it. And it might not work exactly the way that you want it to. Really, the problem of browser compatibility is is twofold. All right. Number one, the specifications are evolving as people are making browsers. In other words, it's not as though they release the final version of what the HTML5 specification is, and browser makers around the world say, "Okay, we're going to start with that, and we're going to develop a perfect browser for HTML5." The final specification of HTML5 hasn't even been approved yet. The, the committee that does it has been working on it and has been making, releasing drafts of it, saying that this is what we have so far, this is what we have so far. So that is an evolving process. The people that make browsers aren't going to sit back and wait until everything is carved in stone and finalized. They're going to continue to work it. Uh, and that's why, if you look, Different browsers support different features of HTML5. All right. Um, because, again, the specification is evolving as the people that are making the browsers continue to create it. All right. 
features other than the specification for getting a new browser out. For example, if there's a security issue or a new version of the operating system coming out or whatever. People that make the browsers, you know, Microsoft's, the Mozilla people, uh, Apple folks, they're going to be releasing uh, their browser. We'll have to create a new version of the browser to go with the operating system or if there's security issues or whatever. So it's an evolving thing. They're going after a moving target. So they may not get everything perfect about the version of HTML5 uh, as it exists uh, you know, at any point in time. The other issue is that people who make browsers are, are not perfect. They're humans just like anyone else and they're apt to make mistakes. All right. The sad truth is it's your problem to make your web page work. All right. Because we know the solution isn't to go and tell people, well, to view this page correctly, you have to have such and such version of such and such browser. That's uh, an amateurish move and, and you should never do anything like that. This is only becoming worse as people are browsing via mobile devices because with mobile devices that's a whole new set of platforms and not only that, it's a set of platforms that um, are very much different than the desktop platform is because of the screen size and, and for other reasons. Really the key is testing. We talked about two things that you can do to help your page be able to be viewed across earlier versions of, uh, of browsers if you're using HTML5. And that is, one of them is to put in the HTML5 shiv from Internet Explorer, and the other is to create a little Firefox um, CSS file. We can look at this page, for example. And if we look at the code for this page, we will see that it has both of those in there. This is one, a Firefox CSS. All that is, is a little CSS file that says, that tells the browser to treat these new HTML5 tags as block tags. So header, nav, section, article, aside, and footer, treat them as display of block. That doesn't mean that it's going to make old versions of Firefox 100% HTML5 compatible, but it's going to handle those main tags. Those are some of the main differences, some of the main additions to HTML5. And it, this little snippet of CSS code will make sure that prior versions of Firefox will handle these tags correctly. And a comparable thing is done with the HTML5 shiv, and we've seen that example before. That's code that you can just download and you can use it. You don't have to necessarily um, write it on your own. So those two things are two important things to do, and those should be in every single page that you create, all right, going forward. Well, yeah, I mean, there is a CSS file involved here, so, but the links to it should be in every HTML page that you create. The link to the Firefox CSS and the little snippet of code for the um, HTML5 shiv. No, it needs to be included in the HTML. All right. Now, nothing beats testing now. We can put these this code in, we can do things according to standards, but when the day is done, you need to test across as, as many platforms as possible. I do have to laugh sometimes. I've had students tell me I've tested it on all browsers. They have not tested it across all browsers. All right? And when I ask them why, they say, well, I tested on Chrome, Firefox, and Internet Explorer. Well, what versions are those? Well, one version of each. Well, 
each version of the software is a different browser, is different software, and you need to test across it. Plus, there's a whole bunch of browsers that are less commonly used, but still are used. There's the Opera browser that I heard some people talking about before class. On the Mac side, there's Safari. Or Safari. Uh, there's also um, other ones that are less commonly used. All right, but still, they're all browsers, and you want to test on as many as possible. All right. There's actually some tools online that allow you to do cross-browser testing. And you can test a few pages typically for free, and then if you want to pay for that service, like if you were a consulting company, you could pay for that service and test all your code across that. Let's see if we can pull up one of those. What this will do is you can enter a URL, and it will test in all these, and it will give you screenshots of all these different browsers. Now, these are browsers some of mine never heard of, Ice Weasel. I had no idea there was such a browser called Ice Weasel. I guess that's a Linux browser. Uh, for Windows, different versions of Chrome and Firefox, I don't see Internet Explorer. But at any rate, you can go in and you can put a, a, a URL in. Let's put a simple URL in. And it'll show you what it looks like across multiple screenshots. They've already done this one today, so they'll show you what it looks like in different browsers. Links notice. That's a text-based browser. This is like a really old-school browser. It doesn't do any graphics or anything. Uh, but notice that Google even works in that environment. And you can see how it's, Google, being a pretty simple page, looks pretty much the same based on uh, a number of different browsers. Let's go in and let's try... Okay, they're doing something with a redirect. Okay, there we go. Let's try this. Okay, they put me in a queue, and uh, it, it will take uh, estimate two minutes, two to thirty minutes, to give me a screenshot. Um, if you uh, have priority processing, again, uh, you can get uh, results quicker with this. The idea is, though, is that this is, a, this is an automated way of doing it, and it's another way to test it and view it, because who has all those machines at their disposal? Again, a large organization uh, is liable to have a little usability lab or a testing lab where they can test their stuff, but for most, most individuals and most small companies, that's out of the realm. Usually what I do is I just call people up and hope that they have different browsers and, and test it uh, across platforms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the code should work yeah, in, in as many browsers as possible. Exactly, yes. It should be on every, every page, the code that, that uh, ensures browser compatibility. Now, that's one step that you can do to ensure browser compatibility, the testing and all that. Another step that you can do, and I'm kind of doing these maybe in a wrong order because maybe you should do this first, is validating your HTML code. What do I mean by validating your code? Well, I can look at a piece of HTML code that I've created, like this for example. And I think I followed all the rules of HTML, right? Looks like every starting tag has an ending tag, right? Stuff is nested properly. But how do I know I haven't missed something, right? 
And how do I know that maybe there aren't some rules that I wasn't aware of? All right. The organization which creates these standards, the W3C, W3C.org is their address, has a bunch of validators that you can go to. And the markup validator is what we are interested in. And what we can do is we can either give a URL, we can upload our file, or we can, what I usually do, copy and paste into this text area. And it will validate that. In other words, it will tell me if I followed all the rules of HTML. All right? So let me go here and let me select everything. and do a check. It found one error and five warnings. So there's an error in this code somewhere. Let's see what the error is. Okay. Ah, this is actually kind of a uh, a goofy error. Notice the difference between these quotes and these quotes. I'll make it real big so it's obvious. Those quotes are rounded. These quotes are... It doesn't like those other quotes. So I'm going to go in and change that. and then I can revalidate it. Now notice the verbiage it uses. Bad value en for attribute lang on element. The language subtag en is not a valid language subtag blah 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 blah. It doesn't come out and tell you, hey, dummy, you use the wrong kinds of quotes. All right? Remember, this is not a person that's looking at your code. This is a computer program. And as such, it looks in a very mechanical way. All right? Um, and as such, it doesn't necessarily tell you exactly where the error is. Sometimes it tells you around where the error is. And your job is to figure it out. So now I fix that. And... If I revalidate it, yay, it was successfully checked as HTML5. There's five warnings. We won't talk about the warnings now, um, but it doesn't have any errors. All right. Remember back from the first few days of class, what happens if you violate the rules of language? You don't know. The page may work and may display correctly, or there may be issues in how it displays. Your best bet in ensuring cross-browser compatibility, the first step is to validate your pages. Because if you follow the rules, there may still be an issue. Why? Well, because browsers have bugs in them. And because browsers are developed in an evolving manner, where they're developed as the rules, the specifications are developing. So just because you got it perfect doesn't mean that it's going to display perfect across every platform. And that is one of the most frustrating aspects of web development, when you've done everything correctly and there's still a problem. Guess what? It's still your job to fix it. All right? Because you have to deal with the reality of the situation that there are going to be people out there running a browser that has bugs in it, and you still want your page to be able to work. But this is a great first step. All right, in ensuring that your pages will be um, viewed correctly. Let's go in and let's break some pages. Let's break this page by, by putting in some incorrect tags. And let's see the error messages it gives us. For example, I'm going to get rid of the nav tag. All right, so we know exactly what I'm doing. 
So the error is going to be that there's no end navigation tag. And I click revalidate. It actually gives me two errors, even though there's only one thing wrong. The two our errors are end body tag for end tag for body scene, but there were unclosed elements. Now that's not very straightforward language, but since we know the problem, we can sort of figure out what it means. In other words, there was a tag that was opened within the body section that wasn't closed within the body section. So it knows that that's a problem. It knows that that's a problem. Because if it was a tag that is open in the body section, it needs to be closed within the body section. So it hit the end body tag, and there was still a tag that wasn't closed. Well, the next line gives us an even stronger hint, and it tells us that we don't have a closing tag for nav. So in that case, it's pretty straightforward. So if we fix that, we should be able to validate again. Let's get rid of the UL tags, the start and the end UL tag. It's going to give us a bunch of errors. Let's see what all they, how many errors it gives us. It gives us five errors. And those five errors are element LI not allowed as child element of nav in this context. What does that mean? Well, simply put, we know that LIs belong in an ordered or unordered list. So an LI can't be in a nav section by itself. It has to be part of either an ordered or an unordered list. So we go in and we put in UL Oops. and NUL. And we're back in business. It takes a little while to sort of get uh, the skill of reading the errors and understanding what they mean. So as you're validating, and I would again encourage you to validate all your pages from now on, as you're validating them, if you have trouble interpreting what the errors are saying, let me know. And I can, I can help you out with that. Because there is quite an art to it. Um, one thing I will say is if you get a bunch of errors, don't panic. A lot of the times one error can trigger, one mistake can trigger so, a lot of different errors, several different errors. And in addition, then correcting it is easy. All right? Or if there's one little thing that you missed in creating a tag, and if you've done that several times, it'll give you the same error over and over again. So don't panic if it shows 57 errors. All right? And I'm not even exaggerating. You know, if you go back and validate some of your older uh, stuff, um, you know, you may see a lot of errors. On a lot of assignments, I've commented things like that doesn't belong there. That doesn't belong in the head section. It belongs in the body section. Well, this will be an extra set of eyes for you to double check that and to make sure that you put things in the proper section. In addition to the HTML validator, there's also CSS validation. So I can go. here for the CSS validator and same thing I can put my CSS code in that's kind of a boring one I can put my CSS code in and validate it, and it tells me, hey, I don't have any errors in it. This is particularly useful to do if you, if you, look, at your C, if you look at your web page and it doesn't look the way that you expect. In other words, you know, I'll get a lot of times you know, people say something like, well, 
You know, the, the background color to this page or is supposed to be red, but it's not. You know, what's going on? Well, chances are if you run it through the validator, you're liable to see exactly what's wrong with it. Um, so use these as a way, you know, think of these almost like the spell check uh, or grammar check of web development. All right? Just like spell check and grammar check doesn't guarantee that your term paper is going to make sense and be a good term paper, right? But it's going to make sure you haven't broken any rules. So it's a good first step in proofreading your paper. In running your pages through these and your CSS files through these, it's a good st first step in checking and making sure that everything's OK with your pages. So I would urge you to try this in lab. Go back and try revalidating your old assignments. And definitely do it on assignments going forward. All right, It can save you a lot of grief um, as far as cross-browser compatibility issues. All right, we've been talking about cross-browser compatibility and probably a better way to put, instead of simply saying cross-browser, cross-platform because mobile platforms really have changed the game quite a bit. All right, what is the difference in the user's experience of surfing the web on a mobile device versus surfing the web on a desktop device? or even a laptop. How is it different for a user? All right, number one, the size of the screen. That's certainly the most obvious one. What else is different? Okay, excellent. Uh, what we will do is we'll summarize that by saying input method is different. One, one second, please. Input method is different. Uh, the student described a situation on, on eBay where you would use the mouse to click on something and then scroll, where that's difficult to do on a touch screen. Just uh, you, you don't. You know, it doesn't work that it doesn't work in the same way. <clears throat> in addition, typically there are soft keys rather than, than a hard keyboard. You're not sitting there in classic typing position. You're poking with one or two fingers or whatever. Um, and so the, uh, a way to summarize that is to simply say the input method is, is different. All right? If you think about it, even the problem I run into is sort of related to that. Is, is if links are too, too close together. You know, I got a big old hand and I go to click something, I'm able to click six different links, right? And it's going to bring one of them up, you know? Well, it's harder to do that um, in the case of a mobile device. Uh, student mentioned lack of flash depending on the particular device. And, uh, um, Flash is a what what they call typically a browser plugin, all right. And Flash does things like animation, and you can do games in it, and so on. Uh, okay. The, I, the the bigger principle though is that some plugins, some browser additions that work in desktop platforms don't work in mobile. And just because it drops support doesn't mean that stuff that used to work is going to break that instant. Question? Yes. Right. You can zoom in. Right. Uh, you can zoom in on... Right. You can zoom in on, a, on that. And you can sort of zoom in on a desktop even. All right, um, but yeah, that's one thing that sort of mitigates some of these things, the fact that you can zoom in. Um, anything else that's different? What about someone's connection to the internet on a mobile device? 
as compared to a desktop. Okay? Right. Right. Uh, we'll summarize all these by saying internet connection issues, depending again on exactly how you're connecting uh, to it. You're apt to have a slower connection and a less reliable connection. Um, the one thing I thought I heard, oh, um, what about the, po the processing power of your device versus a, a desktop computer? Pardon me? Pardon me? Yeah, mobile is, mobile is going to be, mobile device is going to be less powerful in general terms. Doesn't mean that some mobile devices aren't great and are very powerful, but they're typically, if we're going to generalize, they're going to be less powerful than that. So there's all kinds of physical differences between accessing it on a desktop device and on a mobile device. The screen is smaller. So if we're not careful, it's going to be hard to read. All right. One other difference is the screen can be oriented one of two different ways on a mobile device, whereas typically you're not going to do that on a desktop device. In other words, if you hold your device in portrait mode, it will be organized that way. If you rotate it, many uh, uh, brow browsers will switch over and show you in landscape mode, whereas you typically don't do that with that. So there are physical differences between a mobile device and a desktop device. Are there other differences besides physical differences? In other words, do people use their mobile device to browse the web in the same way that they use the desktop device in browsing the web? And let me give you a for instance. Let's imagine that you're visiting LC's website and you're sitting at a desktop computer versus visiting LC's website using your mobile phone. Are there some things that you would be more likely to use your mobile phone for and some things you'd be more likely to use a desktop for? Yes. Right. Okay, the statement was is, is a student did a quick query to see what classes were available using the mobile device, but they're going to use a desktop device to do the actual scheduling. Now, why would you use a desktop device to do the actual scheduling? Okay, you can see better. Yeah. All right, so... Um, if I were to summarize that, I would say that scheduling a class is, scheduling, making your schedule for, for spring semester is a relatively involved process. It's not just a straightforward like boom, 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 and I'm done. You're going to look, you might compare what's offered, you might see what other options are. You might want to look and see what your requirements are for your degree program. You might want to look to see what classes are offered when, what classes are offered online versus offered in person, and so on. It's a sort of an involved process. So doing a quick inquiry to see, hmm, is Java offered next semester? Might be something that, yeah, okay, we, could, we can do that via mobile. But doing a long process might be something that we would do on a desktop uh, device. Can anyone think of another thing that they would use the mobile device for that they would not use, or, or use, be more apt to use a mobile device for than to use a desktop? Checking email, right? See if there's anything important that you would, you would have. All right, that you can probably do just as well with a mobile device versus a desktop device. But I'll tell you, if I'm going to, dis if I'm going to make a long thoughtful response, I'm probably going to do it from my desktop. 
you know, simply because I find typing on one of the, the virtual keyboards to be a pain. So if I'm going to just send a short response, okay, <laughs> you know, I can do that from the, from the mobile device. But if I'm going to sit back and write an involved response, I probably will do that from the desktop. Anything else that you would you maybe use a desktop for versus a mobile or the mobile versus a desktop? Okay. Checking the bank account because of security issues, I would assume that you would, you would use the desktop, so that's a good one. Other comments? During homework, yeah, you, so you might like use it to log on to Angel to check to see um, what your grades are so far. But like you're probably not going to go and do your homework and upload it via your mobile device. Yes? Yeah, if you're driving and looking up directions, right? Or you're driving and, well, hopefully you pull off the side of the road before you do that. <laughs> but, uh, or, if you're, or if you are at work, let's say, and you're going to be, be late for your midterm exam and you want to know the professor's phone number, all right? You might want to look that up and, and give them a call. Um, directions from based on where you are, you, you, you know, are very good via mobile. Uh, if you are at work and it is a blizzard out, now that we're in fall approaching winter, this is going to become an issue, right? You might use your mobile device before you start to drive, you know, from your work to the campus here to see if the campus is, is uh, canceled. In general, if we can generalize the difference between using a mobile device and a desktop device, there's, first of all, there's all of the hardware limitations, the limitations that are built into the device itself. But there's also differences of the mindset that people have. People typically use their mobile devices in, searching the, in, in accessing the web for very specific, quick sort of informational queries. For anything that is a long, involved process, people would tend to use a desktop machine. And again, it's not 100% obviously, and different people are different. Different people have a greater comfort with mobile devices than, than others do, and so on. But as a general rule, things that are quick and focused make sense to be, used, to be done via mobile, all right? Something that you... Uh, is important to know while you are out and about, a very quick sort of query, versus something that is a more thoughtful, involved process, may be more of a desktop thing. So in a, uh, if I can s summarize that even further, I would say that people typically have different goals when they're accessing their site, via, accessing a site via a mobile browser than when they're accessing it via a desktop browser. And if you remember back on the whole lecture of web design and web design principles, we know that focusing on the goals that people have is paramount in doing good web design. All right? So, how do people handle this? Well, it depends. It depends on a lot of things. It depends, first of all, on how large of a website we're talking about. For some organizations, there might not be much difference at all between the mobile website and the desktop website. Can anyone think of an example of an organization where there won't be necessarily a lot of difference between the mobile and the desktop version of the site? Yeah, a company or any sort of organization. Pardon me? News? Yeah. Right. You're saying there's not much difference there? Right. I, I would say I would argue that a little bit simply because of the physical dimensions of it. If I go to CNN, for example, on the desktop, there's a lot of real estate on my monitor to display a hundred different stories. If I go on my phone, maybe they can only show the top three or four. Google's pretty similar, right? You go, you put it in, you get the results. Facebook, 
Yeah, I guess. There's some things that you can do on the desktop version that you can't do on a mobile version. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah. One thing I'm thinking of is like a restaurant. All right? A restaurant. If you think about a restaurant's page or website, what are they going to have? They're going to have a home page that sort of tells you the basics about it. They might have, like, contact us, a phone number to call for reservations. They might have a page for directions, how to get there, you know, where they're located, uh, and hours. They might have sample menus, specials. But it's going to be a fairly small site, probably, for, for uh, a restaurant, all right, compared to a college that has many different departments and serves many different kinds of people. You know, if we're going to talk about the kinds of people that visit the restaurant. Yeah, there's different sorts of people that are visiting the restaurant. There's, there's, you know, couples visiting it. There's families visiting it, and so on. But really, hungry people are the people that are visiting restaurants. If you talk about the kinds of people that are visiting a college's website, well, from the exercise that we did earlier in the semester, we see that there's a whole bunch of different kinds of people that visit a college's website. So for more simple sites that have a very specific purpose uh, and most of their users are after the same thing, maybe there's going to be a similarity between the desktop and the mobile version. All right. For larger websites where there's going to be a big difference, there is apt to be uh, bigger differences between the mobile and the desktop. So there's a couple strategies that web developers can take. In a nutshell, you can have a single site or multiple sites. The restaurant would be an example of an organization that might have simply a single site. Because visiting it from a desktop, visiting it from a mobile, probably not a huge difference in between the goals of the users. Whereas a larger site, such as a college or a large news organization, might have multiple sites. All right? Now, with the physical limitations of the screen, we talked about things like multiple columns don't really work very well in a mobile environment, where they work very well on a desktop environment. All right? With a single site, the buzzword is responsive web design. And we've already, without using this term, we've already s explored the basics of responsive web design. We've talked about having a good separation between your HTML and CSS, where there's nothing about the appearance in the HTML. Everything about the appearance is encoded in the CSS. That's a fundamental principle of responsive design. That's like the starting point. If you haven't done that, then you can't do the rest of responsive design. We talked about using floating elements as opposed to fixed elements. With floating elements, we can use the web, we can use our CSS to make a page look differently on a wider monitor than on a narrow monitor. All right, and we've seen how to do that already. We've seen that if you have two columns that are 400 pixels wide, if you float them, all right, on a wide monitor, they'll be side by side. On a narrow monitor, such as a mobile device, they'll be stacked vertically. So, using floating elements, using percentages instead of absolute pixels is another principle. We saw how we could put a percentage on an image. So we don't say that an image is going to be a certain number of pixels. We say it's going to be a certain percentage of its width. And that way we can make the image look one way if we're displaying it on a gigantic monitor. If we're displaying it on a smaller 
mobile screen, we can make it look different still. All right. The last aspect of mobile design is where we're going to pick up next time, and that is with what are called media queries. Media queries are where we can actually write code to allow the browser to choose between two different CSS files. All right. We've talked about, we've done examples in lab where we've had two CSS files where you've gone in and you've created a web page and put the first CSS file. Then you've gone and made a clone of that web page and put a second CSS file in. What we're actually going to do is we're going to let the browser decide which CSS file to apply to a given situation. So we can format it one way if it's on a desktop and we can format another way if it's on a mobile device. And the browser is going to make that decision, not us, not the user. That's sort of the missing piece, and that's going to sort of bring everything together into us truly doing a responsive web page. That's where we'll pick up next time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to upload the example that we're going to talk about next time. I'm going to upload that uh, now, and you can take a look at it between now and Wednesday, and Wednesday that will be our starting point. We'll also talk about having multiple sites, but we will not implement that code um, because that requires server-side scripting and, and we don't really talk about server-side scripting or we really don't do server-side scripting in this class. Um, there's a whole, this is just sort of scratching the surface of mobile web design. There's a whole bunch of things that you can have in your bag of tricks to do this. Um, and we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about some of those, but we'll really explore the one of them in detail. Questions at this point? Questions in North Ridgeville? Are you okay? All right, time for lab. <laughs>